Facebook started February 4th, 2004. Today, 20 years later, there are 2.96 billion users. Twitter started March 21st, 2006, and today has 353.9 million users. Instagram, October 6, 2010, today 1.3 billion users. Snapchat, September 16th, 2011, today 525.7 million users. TikTok, 2016, September of 2016, and today over 1 billion users. MySpace, August 1st, 2003, today zero users. <laughs> Can you, can you believe the oldest company I just mentioned is MySpace, and it's only 20 years old? Think about that. Social media at most has only existed for 20 years, and yet the platforms are used by millions and some of them billions of people. That is amazing. Why have social media platforms grown so rapidly? Well, I don't know for sure, because I'm not a sociologist, but I think one obvious reason is because people love what social media platforms allow them to do, right? Pretty simple. Social media platforms are great because they make it possible for us to connect and keep up with old friends and family members. They help you remember people's birthdays. They provide entertainment for when we're bored. Social media is even helpful for businesses getting their name out there. They're, they're great for the modern day garage sale called Facebook Marketplace. They're great for sending us ads for products that we didn't know existed, but they spied on our conversations and so they sent it to us. Yep. You know, we all complain about it, but you also know you love that, right? You're like, oh great, there is a business, you know? Spiritually speaking, social media platforms allow us to share the gospel with our friends and strangers alike. We can share sermons from our favorite pastors, and we can post biblically uplifting verses daily to encourage anyone who might go see our posts. For those and many other reasons that I haven't even mentioned yet, I don't think it's any mystery why social media has been so successful in getting more and more users. The upside is so great. But let me ask you a question. Do you think there are any downsides to social media? Considering social media at most has only existed for 20 years and considering how rapidly it's become an integral part of our society, do you think it's possible that there are downsides to social media that we don't even fully understand yet? I think, I think we all would agree it's not just possible, but it's factual. As in, we all know there are downsides to social media. Social media is a great tool and can be used for many great things, but as a tool, it can also be used to cause serious damage. A hammer is a great tool to be used in a lot of construction projects, but used in the wrong hands foolishly, it can cause serious damage. A nail gun is a great tool. It can expedite construction projects. It's great, but in the wrong hands used foolishly, it can cause serious damage. And social media is a great tool for social networking, but used foolishly, it can cause serious damage. And it seems like more and more people are seeing the downsides to social media. Researchers Gene Twinge and Keith Campbell released a groundbreaking study a few years ago that demonstrated there is a direct correlation between mental health and time spent on screens and social media. In their study, they asked questions from 19 categories of mental health. Okay, they asked questions from these different 19 areas and uh, participants who use social media more across the board scored consistently lower in 18 of the 19 categories. In 2015, the Journal of Experimental Psychology, they published a study revealing social media use is directly connected to rapid mood swings and not in the positive direction. It's very common for people to log on to social media and within moments feel sad, anxious, grumpy, annoyed, and irritable. Just, just moments before they were fine. But then they get on and it quickly changes their mood. 
And several studies have shown the more we use social media, the less we were able to connect socially. People are getting so used to responding through a screen that they don't know what to do when they're face to face with each other. And this isn't just Christian propaganda saying all social media is of the devil. No, like this is just normal people observing what's happening in our world. But I do think this does beg the question from a Christian perspective, how are Christians supposed to use social media? You see, that's the elephant in the room. Christian social media habits. By far, the majority of the people in this room have social media. 70% of Americans have slash use social media. And if those stats are true, then that means about six to 700-ish of you in this room have social media. And I'm sure most of you that do would say you have it because you enjoy the things that we talked about just a few minutes ago. But I'm also sure that most of you that do have it would also admit that you're not 100% satisfied with your social media habits. On those things, most of us agree. But what most people haven't done is step back and ask, is social media and my use of it godly? Is how I'm using social media beneficial to me and those around me? Is social media causing me to stumble? Should I even have social media as a Jesus follower? See, these are the questions that, granted, some people have stopped, asked, and made appropriate adjustments, but by far, the majority have not. And so, this morning, we're going to change that. This morning, we are going to talk about the elephant in the room. This morning, we are going to talk about social media. And let me just say up front, you everyone listening? My goal this morning is not to shame you or twist your arm into deleting all your social media accounts. My goal this morning is, however, for all of us to live in submission to Jesus' lordship in every area of our life, including and especially over our use of social media. You say, whoa, time out, flag on the play. Preston, social media did not exist 2,000 years ago, so how could Jesus' lordship have anything to do with my use of social media? And if you're thinking that, you're right. Social media did not exist 2,000 years ago, but people did. Interactions between people, socializing did. And God has very clear instructions in his word about how his people live, how his people interact with each other, and how they interact with the outside world, and, and how they spend their time. In fact, God, through the Apostle Paul, gives very specific instructions for how God's people are to live in several books of the Bible, but also in the book of Ephesians. And this morning, I want to look at those commands in Ephesians and the principles behind them, and specifically consider what they teach us about a Christian's use of social media. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, you are in church, please open them to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Four. Ephesians chapter 4, and while you turn there, context, Paul is in prison, and he's writing to a group of Jesus followers in Ephesus. Simple enough? That's the context. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay, so let's pause right there. To understand Paul's command here, there are three quick things that we need to comprehend. Number one, what does Paul mean by walk? He doesn't mean the physical action of walking, okay? When we see the word walk in narratives of Scripture, such in the New Testament, like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts, when we read narratives, then yes, the word walk refers to almost always the physical action of walking. But in the New Testament letters, the word walk is used 49 times, and 47 of those uses, the word is used metaphorically to refer to one's conduct and lifestyle. In fact, walk is used eight times in the book of Ephesians, and every single use it's used to refer to one's lifestyle. So in this verse, Paul is not talking about how we physically walk. He's talking about our lifestyle. So we could just replace the word with 
live. Okay, number two, what does Paul mean by worthy? The word translated worthy literally means bringing up the other beam of the scales. So what I want you to do is I just want you to think about a scale that has two sides, okay? One side has five pounds on it and it's pressed down. The other side only has two pounds, so it's lighter and it's lifted up, okay? To make the scale worthy, we would need to add three pounds to this side to make it equivalent, to make it worthy. Lastly, number three, what calling is Paul talking about? He's not talking about a calling into ministry. He's not talking about a calling into a certain vocation. And he's not talking about a calling into a certain relationship. No, Paul is talking about the call of God that he offers every single person, the call to be saved. God offers a restored relationship to all who hear the gospel. If you have ever heard about Jesus, how he died on the cross and rose again to pay for your sins, and how he's inviting you to believe in him, to follow him, so that you guys can have a restored relationship, if you have ever heard that, which you just did, then you have heard the calling that Paul is talking about here. And let me just say, I know we're like only five minutes into this, but if you're here right now, and you know you aren't saved, you know you aren't right with God, you know you haven't answered God's call, I just want to ask you to please not leave here without answering the call. Make sure today you answer that call. How do you do that? Really simple. Believe and follow. Believe and follow. Believe and follow. Believe in? Follow. follow. Believe in Jesus' death and resurrection, that his work is sufficient to pay for your sins, and decide today from this day forward to follow Jesus. Now, with those three things in mind, what Paul meant by walk, worthy, and calling, let's put all this together. Paul says to the Ephesians, and thus every Jesus follower today, live in a manner worthy of God's calling. So let's think about the scale again, okay? God's calling of, uh, of salvation is on one side, and man, that's a heavy weight. Think about what we're talking about when we say God called us to be saved. We're saying that he loved us when we didn't love him. He loves us when we mess up still to this day. He pursued us by dying on the cross for us and raising again. That's this side. And the other side is your life. And Paul says, make it worthy, as in make it equal. Make the actions of your life Show that you grasp the gravity of this call. Make the actions of your life show that you appreciate God's call. Now, how in the world do we do that? And that's what Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 is all about. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all three chapters in their entirety. But Paul does give four more walk statements that capture in principle fashion everything else he says. And I want to look at those statements and specifically consider their implication for our use of social media so that we can live lives worthy of God's call even on social media. So what I want to do right now is I want to show you the four statements up front, and then we're going to break them down one by one. Okay, so notice with me on the screen the first one. And so in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, This I say, testify in the Lord. You must no longer walk, as the Gentiles do. Chapter 5, verse 2, he says, walk in love. Then in chapter 5, verse 8, he says, walk as children of the light. And finally, in chapter 5, verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I believe these four commands and their surrounding context reveal four guidelines. Everybody say four guidelines. Four guidelines we must adhere to if we are going to use social media. But before we dive into any of that, let's pause and pray. God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the opportunity this morning to study it together. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would be our teacher. You'd lift up your word and help us see what it says, and help us also make appropriate application to our life, specifically of our use of social media. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so four guidelines. If you're going to have social media, then first of all, first guideline, have a purpose. Have a purpose. Look with me at Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So the first command is a command to not walk like a certain group of individuals, namely the Gentiles. Ironically, most of the people Paul was writing to 
were Gentiles. A Gentile is any person who's not Jewish, okay? But the command here is not about race and culture. It's about knowledge. Gentiles weren't Jewish. Therefore, they didn't have the law of God. They didn't know what God expected. In a very real sense, Gentiles lived in complete ignorance of God's expectations. They didn't know any better. And you can see this is Paul's understanding and what he's referring to by just looking at the rest of the verse. Look at it with me. He says, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. How do they walk, Paul? In the futility of their minds. Futility just means vanity, purposelessness, or worthlessness. Because the Gentiles lacked purpose in their minds, they lacked purpose in their lives. Notice how Paul continues in verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding, as if if their understanding was in a room, the light in the room is off. They don't know what's there. Therefore, they are, look at the rest of the verse, alienated from the life of God. Again, why, Paul? Because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So notice what he says, he's saying, Gentiles, or we could just say any person who doesn't know God and his expectations, they walk around with futile thinking. They don't actually know the purpose they were created for. Therefore, they live a life of futility. They live a life without purpose. Therefore, they do things without a purpose. And Paul comes in and says, hey, Jesus follower, you don't live like that anymore. If you're a Christian, you don't walk around without a purpose. You don't live life without a purpose. You don't use social media without a purpose. If you're a Christian in this room, you aren't a Gentile anymore in the sense that you aren't a person who doesn't know God anymore. You are a man or you are a woman made in God's image. You are a Jesus follower. You are to live your life in a manner worthy of the calling God has for you in your life when he saved you. Therefore, you shouldn't do anything without a purpose. And instead, you should do everything with a purpose, including social media. Which is why our first guideline for those who choose to have social media is to have a purpose. And here's three things. Have a purpose for having social media, have a purpose for logging on to social media, and have a purpose for posting slash commenting on social media. Just, just think about this with me, church. Why do you have social media? What's your purpose? Because everyone else has one? Is it to serve God? And if you say that, really, is it? How about this? Parents in the room, I'm about to step on some toes. If your kids have social media, why? What's the purpose of that? Is it so your kid can be a witness for Jesus on social media? And if so, are they even ready for that? Amen. Have you trained them for that? Are you modeling for them what that looks like? Are they doing it? Is it so they can get in, uh, extra information about extracurriculars they are in? And if that's the case, could they or could not you get that information through other avenues? What about, what about logging on to social media? Why do we log on to social media? Is it to take a break? To give your mind a rest after a long day, right? Because, you know, you in the office, you just had to work so hard and you had to do so much thinking. Or for students, you know, you just, you need a break because you've been reading all day and writing papers. Or parents, the kids were just so crazy in the house and they finally down for a nap. So I just need to rest and scroll social media. And if that's really the case, who said social media was the place Christians go to to rest? Study after study reveals social media disrupts sleep cycles, fosters quick mood springs, induces anxiety and depression. Why in the world are we going to social media for rest? Christian, Jesus said, come to him for rest. Matthew... Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I, Jesus will give you rest. Thank you, Lord. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I, Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. And notice the promise. You will find rest for your souls. 
you know, I've experienced, and I've talked to people who've experienced that after they went on social media, that they just, they're frustrated, they're irritable. Not every time, but it happens. But you know what I've never experienced? I've never heard someone say, man, I'm just so frustrated right now. What's wrong? I just was reading my Bible and just, oh. <laughs> I just put my kids down and I worked on my memory verses and, oh, I'm just so, oh. I went to my closet, got on my knees and prayed for five minutes and, oh my gosh. I've never experienced that. Never heard of someone experiencing that. Posting, commenting. When you post something, what's your purpose? When when you made that comment on someone else's post, what were you thinking was going to happen? Was it to encourage or was it to tear down? Do you even know or do you just do it impulsively? Church, hear God's word this morning. We don't live like Gentiles anymore. As in, we don't live without a purpose. We have a purpose for everything we do, including why and how we use social media. If you're going to have social media, then number one, have a purpose. Number two, love God and others. Love God and others. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Notice what he says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. So Paul gives a command to imitate God, and then he gives another command that reveals how we imitate God. We imitate God by walking in love. But what does it mean to walk in love? We'll look at the rest of the verse. Verse 2. Walk in love, how? As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To describe what it means to walk in love, Paul points to Jesus as the example. And in Jesus' example, we see two recipients of his love. The first recipient is others, namely us. Notice Jesus loved us. Jesus gave himself up for us. His love was directed towards saving us, others. And the second recipient is God. Notice his actions were a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to who? To to who? To God, right? So yes, his love was directed toward us and saving us, but it was also directed toward God in that he willingly submitted to the Father's plan of salvation for you and me. If we're going to imitate God and walk in love, then that means we are to live a life loving God and loving others. And this principle is not taught just here in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, but it's also taught by Jesus himself. Matthew 22, 37 to 40, a man goes up to Jesus. He says, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend or hang all the law and the prophets. So every command that was ever given was given to fulfill one of these two commands, either loving God or loving others. Which is why our second guideline for having social media as Christians is to use it to love God and to love others. Now, before you tune me out, I know this sounds simple, and it is, but church, unfortunately, most people aren't using social media to love God. Most people aren't using social media to love others. Most people are using social media to get others to love me, to love themselves. In fact, this is not just me saying this. Literally, later, with your phone, in your search engine, type in social media and narcissism. (laughs) That wasn't a joke. What is narcissism? It's the excessive interest in or admiration of oneself. In 2011, the American Psychological Association published a paper showing that people who use social media displayed more narcissistic narcissistic behaviors than those that didn't. That was 2011. Since then, time has gone by and study after study has demonstrated social media is not only a playground for current narcissists, but it's a training ground for future narcissists. Why? Because it's a self-promotion platform. 
because it's social media. Let me share my thoughts. Let me tell you what I'm doing. Let me show you what I look like by taking a selfie. (laughs) This is comical but also sad. Did you know 93 million selfies are taken every day? Did you know 1,000 selfies are posted every 10 seconds? There's another 1,000. And another 1,000. Did you know people are more likely, five times more likely, to die in a selfie-induced accident than by getting attacked by a shark? (laughs) If If we're not careful, then just by the very nature of what social media is, we will become people obsessed with what others think about us. Is it wrong to post a picture of you and your family? No. Rejoice in the life God's given you. um, Rejoice in the family God's given you and and share your excitement and your thankfulness with others. But if you find yourself upset or frequently monitoring, if someone commented on your status or your picture, if you find yourself upset because you only got so many likes on your status or your picture, then you aren't using social media to love God and love others. It's to get others to love you. Is it wrong to share what you're working on in life? No, not necessarily. But if you're actually just humble bragging about how fit you are or your spirituality, then it's not about loving God and loving others. It's about getting others to love you, right? Like when you post, so sore from working out every day two hours before work. (laughs) Why did you post? What was the purpose in that? Or... Sorry, but a lot of you moms, going to fast for social media for two weeks, hit me up if you need me. That's funny because I thought Jesus said, don't tell others when you fast. By the way, though, I don't think that's actual biblical fasting. But still, the point, like, if you're going to claim it, then be biblical about it. it. I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm just, sorry. Actually, I'm not, but... If you're going to have social media, then make sure you're using it to love God and others. Make sure you post things that honor Him. Make sure you post things that honor others. If you're going to share things, share things that honor Him and honor others. If you're going to do anything on there, make sure it's uplifting to Him and uplifting to others. Don't let it be about getting others to love you. If you're going to have social media, then have a purpose. Number two, love God and others. Number three, take in and put out righteous content only. Look with me at Ephesians 5, verse 8. Notice what he says. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So in this command, Paul uses light and darkness imagery. What are these images supposed to refer to? Well, it's really simple. Light equals right. Light equals right. Light represents righteous behavior, and darkness represents wicked behavior. Paul commands Jesus' followers to live righteously, not wickedly. Now, there are numerous actions that are righteous and numerous actions that are wicked. So to say live righteous, don't live wickedly, could refer to a whole host of things. But in this context, Paul is specifically talking about two areas of life. He's talking about our sexual conduct and our conversations. And we know this because that's what he's talking about in this passage. And we can see that if we look just a couple verses ahead. Look with me, just a couple verses ahead in your Bible at verses 3 and 4. Notice what he says. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. So pause real quickly before we look at verse 4. Notice how each of those descriptions have to do with sexual conduct. Sexual immorality, typically that word is translated fornication. And typically people thought that word only referred to two unmarried people having sex. But the word actually has a whole uh, broader range of meaning, okay? Uh, Which is why the ESV translators use the phrase sexual immorality. In other places, the very same term is used to describe premarital sex, adultery, relations with a prostitute, homosexuality, and incestuous relationships. Impurity, the next one. 
Impurity is a general term for referring to anything unclean and dirty. When the term is tied to sexual immorality, as it is here in this verse, it refers to impure thoughts, passions, ideas, and fantasies. And covetousness, it's the idea of greed and a lack of self-control. When the term is connected to sexual morality, again, as it is here, it refers to someone who cannot control their sexual desires, therefore they act out on them. They treat others like objects to be used to please their sexual cravings. All of verse 3 is about one's sexual conduct. Now look at verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Again, each of these three descriptions have to do with our conversations. Filthiness. Filthiness can also be translated as vulgar. It's shameful or foul language, which means it includes cursing. All of you people in here with potty mouths, stop it. But it's certainly not restricted to just cursing. It's any conversation that's shameful. Foolish. Foolish talk is literally translated from the Greek word morologia. It's a compound word meaning two words put together, moros and logos, okay? Moros means dull or stupid. It's the word from which we get our English word moron. And logos is word or talk. So foolish talk refers to moronic, stupid, baseless conversations. It's the idea of saying things without warrant for saying them. Going on social media pretending to be an expert about something you aren't. Crude joking. We see this term and we think it has a sexual connotation, and it can. That's wrong too. Don't do that. But in this context, the word refers to being witty or quick on your feet to make jokes. And what Paul seems to be condemning here is not one's ability to make jokes, but he's condemning making jokes at others' expense. One commentator said it this way, In the context, it most likely indicates jesting that has gone too far, thus becoming sarcastic ridicule that cuts people down and embarrasses others who are present. When Paul commands us to walk in the light, i.e. do what's right, he's specifically referring to our sexual conduct and our conversations. And before we even stop to consider the implications of those commands on our use of social media, look with me at verses 5 to 7. I want you just to see how important it is that we don't work in those, or walk in those deeds of darkness anymore. Look what he says in verse 5. You may be sure of this. Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. In other words, don't let someone trick you and say, it's okay. It's not. Why, Paul? For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Don't join in doing these wicked things. Why, Paul? For at one time you were darkness. At one time you did do those things, but not anymore. Now, look at it, you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Christians in this room, our identity has changed. We aren't darkness anymore. We're supposed to be light, meaning we are righteous and do righteous things. Which is why the application of this section as it relates to our use of social media is that we take in and put out righteous content only. And we need to be intentional about this. As it relates to sexual conduct, these platforms, they may say they forbid sexually explicit material, but we all know inappropriate sexual conduct is everywhere on these platforms. Right? Videos of inappropriate scenes are shared or made into reels to encourage people to go look up the movie with the scene. Pictures that basically show everything, but because one little tiny piece of clothing covers one little part, it's considered acceptable to these platforms' policies. And even if a video or a picture isn't shown that's inappropriate, links for pornographic websites are put on static images or posted in the comment sections. Furthermore, even if it's not some bad person from some porn site that we don't even know— there are people that you do know that are putting out bad content, snapping bad, like, Snapchat, seriously? I'm not saying it was. But if a social media platform were created to make and send pornography, 
it would be Snapchat. Knowing this kind of material is on these platforms, we need to do our best to not consume that kind of content. Listen, you may not be able to control if one of these platforms randomly puts this kind of sexual content into your For You page, or if a random video pops up into one of your YouTube shorts or Instagram slash Facebook reels. You may not be able to control that, but you can control if you sit there and watch it. You can control if you sit there and watch it again. Additionally, you control if you put sexual immoral content out there. Hey, when you're taking a picture, is what you're wearing appropriate? This is ladies and guys. Ladies, like, for real, stop taking bad pictures. And men also, don't sit there in the mirror and like, what are you doing? Like, if what you're wearing is not appropriate, maybe don't take the picture. And also, more so, don't post it, don't send it. Don't post it, don't send it. (laughs) Just kidding. When you're messaging people or commenting, guys, don't make provocative statements uh, to them. Don't ask for sexually explicit material in people's DMs or whatever. Taking in or putting out material that is sexually immoral is out of place for Christians. And additionally, we need to be intentional about our conversations we're having on these platforms, as well as the conversations we're listening to on these platforms. Do you remember the three words we talked about that characterize the conversation that we shouldn't be having? If someone uses filthy language, don't follow, subscribe, or watch them. It's not worth your holiness. And you say, but it doesn't affect me when I hear other people cussing and saying bad things like that. You know what? I get it. I have said things like that. But I was wrong. God's standard of holiness is not based off what I think I'm affected by. God calls us to be holy, set apart, and that standard is his standard, not what you think it is. Do you think sitting there watching a video with someone using an insane amount of profanities that God would just sit there like, man, this is good stuff? No, he wouldn't. So don't watch it. Secondly, foolish talk. I think Calvin said this a few weeks ago, but social media has created platforms for people to think that they actually have something of value to say. So many people just go on there and say things as if they're experts. And you know what? I don't blame them. Like, what? Again, the platform, like, sets you up to do that. But the problem is, many of us, you take in and you follow influencers that you've never credentialed. Did you look them up to see? Do they have any basis to say what they're saying? We just take it in, and then we put it out like it's gospel truth. Don't, like, don't be duped like that. You could literally be listening to someone who's a complete not smart. (laughs) Thirdly, crude joking. Don't watch or listen to people who make inappropriate jokes at the expense of others. Furthermore, don't be that person who does that. Social media has created the illusion where people can just say whatever they want and think there's no consequences. If you wouldn't say it to someone's face, don't say it online. For some of you, even if you would say it to their face, (laughs) if it's not appropriate, don't say it in person or online. If it's not edifying, don't say it at all. Christians walk in the light. We don't walk in the darkness anymore. Therefore, we take in and we put out righteous content only. If you're going to have social media, then number one, have a purpose. Number two, love God and others. Number three, take in and put out righteous content only. And number four, lastly, regulate your usage. Look with me at Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Okay, Paul, how do I be wise in my life? Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We're to walk wisely, and to be wise means a lot of things. But in this context, Paul is talking about using our time wisely. He wants us to make the best use of our time. Does everybody see that? Is that clear? Make the best use of our time? Can everyone please verbally say if you agree? Okay. All right, put it on the next slide. I want you to see something. 
As of January 2023, the average 16 to 24 year old spends five hours and 49 minutes per day on social media. 25 to 34 year olds, five hours and 31 minutes per day. 35 to 44 year olds, four hours and 49 minutes a day. 45 to 54, three hours and 57 minutes a day. And 55 plus spends three hours and three minutes per day on social media. Church, is that the best use of our time? Somewhere between three and six hours a day? I don't think so. I don't think anyone here would claim that's the best use of our time, but almost all of us say we wish we had more time to get things done. You know, William Penn, he said, time is what we want most, but what we use worst. Everyone said, I want some time, but you use what you got poorly. And according to these stats, that statement is 100% true. Screens and social media have become a serious problem. Church, think about this. I'm not trying to pick up, but kids are crying out to their parents for attention. Mommy, Daddy, look, watch. And instead of giving them the good attention they need, parents are staring at screens. People gather together at school or church or an extracurricular activity or for a meal, and everyone at that circle, whatever it is, whether they vocalize it or not, they are desperately craving physical, relational connectivity, and instead of giving it to each other, we're in a circle and we're staring at a screen. Our souls are craving a relationship with God, our Creator. We want it, and instead of pursuing it via opening our Bible or going to our quiet place and praying, We're staring at a screen. Church, is that really the best use of our time? William James, he said, when we reach the end of our days, our life experience will equal what we've paid attention to, whether by choice or default. The sum of your life will equal what you've paid attention to. It will equal what you spent the most time doing. When you get to the end of your life, do you want your mind to be filled with memories of social media? Or do you want your mind to be filled with memories of the great times you spent with the Lord and serving Him? Memories of the great time you spent with your family, the great time you spent with your friends. Decide today to make the best use of your time. I'm not saying you can't ever spend time on social media, but I'm saying intentionally decide to prioritize what matters most. A Chinese philosopher, he said, time is a created thing. To say I don't have time is to say I don't want to. You have time for what you value most. And you know what? I know No one in here values social media more than they do God. I know no one in here values their family more than they do, or social media more than they do their family. And I know no one in here values social media more than they do their friends. But the problem is most of us haven't stopped to consider what we've been doing with our time. But today that can change. Your time is too valuable to waste three to six hours on social media. Your time... Your time is too valuable to spend two hours on there, one hour. It's too valuable to uh, waste it on that. Regulate your usage to ensure you have time for what matters most. If you're going to have social media, then here's your guidelines. Have a purpose. Love others, not yourself. Take in and put out righteous content only. And number four, regulate your usage. Social media is a great tool that can be used for many great things. But if we're not careful, it can cause us to waste our time, fill our minds with nonsense, become narcissistic, and live without a purpose. But it doesn't have to do that. But it easily can. To be transparent with you, church, a little while back, I can't remember how long it's been, whether it's been years plural or maybe a year ago, I decided to delete all forms of social media from my life. Praise God. For me... No, 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 stop, 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 stop. That's not what I'm asking for. For me, it wasn't worth it. I don't need to risk messing up morally. I don't need to risk messing up my mind. I don't need to risk wasting my time. So for me, I decided to delete it to protect myself so that I could live a life worthy of the calling God has in my life. Now, I know that's not for everyone. I'm not asking for everyone in here to delete their social media accounts. 
I'm asking for everyone in here to address the elephant in the room. Social media is potentially a big stumbling block for so many of us. And if it is for you, then make adjustments. Why? Because we are to live lives, including on social media, that's worthy of God's call in our life. Think about what he did for you. Is he not worth adjusting your life to make sure it's worthy? I think you would all say he is. I'd like to invite everyone in here to please stand with me. We're going to have prayer time. And I want to encourage everyone to do business with God. If you're in here and you need to answer God's call and you need to get saved, please come down here and we would love to help you do that. For everyone else, let's take some time to pray that we would use social media wisely in a way that's worthy of the God's call on our life. In fact, you know what, I, I do want to ask this. If, if you are a Jesus follower in here and you're concerned about what social media is doing to the next generation, would you please come down front with me and just pray that God would give us wisdom on being good role models on how to use it? Would you, would you come down and pray for the souls and the minds? Again, think about this. When we talk about like um, hypnosis or being trained or whatever, like people, the average 16 to 24 year old, six hours a day, what do you think is influencing them? If you're at all concerned about that like me, would you please come down or if you have to stand there, but, but let's, let's get on our knees and just pray, God, please protect the next generation. Please help us advance the gospel despite the challenge of social media. It's great, but there is a big challenge. As they plan, as they sing, it's prayer time. Let's pray.